further ado, I'm very proud to announce um, our featured speaker this evening, Mr. Pickenpaw. And as an educator myself, I'm very honored to announce a, a, another educator and a historian, which is just what I do too, and I just hope to one day maybe do write a book too. That would be wonderful. <laughs> so Mr. Pickenpaw joins us tonight. He is a retired educator. Um, he had a 30-year teaching career at Shenandoah Middle School. And um, he has featured some wonderful books, if you guys get a chance at the end to come up and, and maybe see one of his books and purchase one of his books. But he is here tonight to talk about the book River on a Rampage, and it is the 1936 flood from Chester to Marietta. So without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Roger Pickham. For my next trick, um, I am told that uh, this is the opening lecture in this year's series, so the good news for y'all is after tonight it's got to get better. <laughs> As Erica said, I am going to be talking about the 1936 flood. I refer to it as the forgotten flood because I lost track of how many times when I was doing research and trying to find uh, subjects to be interviewed. People told me, you have the wrong year. The big flood was in 1937. And sure enough, for people who lived from Marietta on down river, Cincinnati, Louisville, uh, 1937 was the year of their epic flood. And over the years, that flood has tended to overshadow the one that occurred in the upper Ohio Valley in 1936. Uh, but there was a flood in 1936, and if you don't believe it, ask anybody who lived here at the time, and they're becoming fewer and fewer. But it, it's, it's something that is seared into people's memories. It started with a very snowy winter of 1936. And then when March arrived came the heavy rains. And what the Weather Bureau at the time referred to as a cold wedge, we'd probably call it a high pressure front today, uh, formed over the Maritimes of Canada, they held those rains in place. And the result was what one uh, representative of the Weather Bureau, long before this expression came into vogue, termed, quote, the perfect storm of its kind. And the result was devastating flooding in 17 states and the District of Columbia, all the way from New England uh, down through and including the Ohio Valley. Just one, for example, uh, the Potomac River Valley from Cumberland to Washington, D.C. Uh, the flooding left over 10,000 people homeless. Hardest hit, most likely, was the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, the flood resulted in about 110 deaths. 85 of those were in the Keystone State. One-seventh of the state was underwater, which is roughly equivalent to the entire state of Maryland in terms of size. In addition to the 85 who, people who were killed, uh, $212 million in damage was done. Now this is in 1936 Depression era dollars. If Pennsylvania was the hardest hit state, the hardest hit part of Pennsylvania was Pittsburgh and the surrounding Allegheny County area. There of Pennsylvania's 85 deaths, 56 occurred. The flooding everywhere from Pittsburgh uh, down through at least Wheeling set records. In Pittsburgh at the point, which is the Golden Triangle today, the flood stage was 46 feet. That was seven feet above the unofficial record, and I say unofficial, that's because that record had been measured in 1763 uh, at Fort Pitt. 50,000 people in Allegheny County were driven from their homes. Uh, some of the stories of the deaths were, were extremely poignant. Uh, one was a man who for eight hours clung to a utility pole. Rescuers made attempt after attempt to rescue him. Every time as they got close, the current would carry their boats away and they just could not get to him. And finally, after eight hours, he lost his grip and slipped from sight. After the floodwaters had receded, a group of utility workers entered a home, uh, 
and they found a man and his two young daughters dead, bullet wounds to the head. And they reasoned that the man decided that uh, that form of death at least would be quicker, preferable to drowning. From Pittsburgh, of course, the flood headed this way to Ohio and West Virginia. And the first community in its path in uh, Ohio County, or not Ohio County, um, what county is Wellsville in? Same as Steubenville. Jefferson, thank you. Didn't know this was going to be interactive, did you? Um, in Wellsville, 1,400 homes were flooded. And Wellsville was the first community in Ohio and West Virginia uh, to be made aware of the fact that this flood was unlike any that had happened before. Uh, many rescuers went out in boats. Uh, at one point, uh, they encountered a man in the second story of his house. They said, we're here to rescue you. He said, oh, don't worry. It's not going to get any higher. Just keep on going. Well, the same boat came by about an hour later, and they heard a cry for help. It was the same man. This time, he wasn't in a second story window. He was hanging onto his chimney on the roof, and they rescued him. Even if you tried to prepare, you might be making a mistake. Case in point, the Wellsville filling station owner. He was afraid that the floodwaters might get into his underground gasoline tanks, so he pumped them out. Well, that made them buoyant, and they came popping out of the ground, uh, floating with the current, tearing porches off houses as they went. As the waters entered Jefferson County, 186 homes were destroyed, Another 909 were damaged. Uh, aid had to be gotten to over 5,000 people. And the first communities in the way were the twin cities of Empire and Stratton, uh, relatively small communities. But in Empire, there were three homes that were not flooded. And a police officer told a reporter afterwards, uh, a lot of people have returned to their homes and they're cleaning the water out while several other people were looking for their homes because they'd been swept away. Um, there was a good deal of destitution in Empire and Stratton, but the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, ran a shuttle uh, to, to help out the people in need. In Mingo Junction, eight feet of water entered the Carnegie Steel Plant, and after it left, there were two feet of slime left behind. In Mingo Bottom, very appropriately named, uh, virtually every home was flooded up to its roof. Floodwaters had never before, though, in Mingo Junction entered the downtown area, which sits a little bit higher. Well, this time they did. And among the business owners who realized that this might be a little bit worse than previous floods was the owner of a Hudson Terraplane dealership. Now, there may be a few people out there that remember the Hudson Terraplane, probably not many, but it was, uh, it was automobiles. He got his cars out and up to higher ground, and it was a lucky thing that he did, because a day later, he needed a hammer for some reason. He went to the dealership to get it in a rowboat. Crossing the river now, we're going to go over into Hancock County, West Virginia. The first community on the flood's path was Chester, but it sits relatively safely above the floodplain, as does Shadyside and Payton City, a few other fortunate river towns. But just down the river, the very, very small community of Congo was not quite so lucky. Now, in Congo, the people apparently were animal lovers. Case in point, one woman who had a cow that she did not want to become a flood victim. She brought it to higher and higher and higher ground in her yard Finally, there was no place she could go in the yard, so she brought the cow into her house. The water came up to its neck, but it did survive. Then there was the man who was rescued uh, by some gentlemen in a rowboat from his house. The rescuer said to him, is there anybody else in the house? He said, yeah, my wife, but don't worry about her. Just go over to that barn and get the mules out. Also in Hancock County, the county seat of New Cumberland, there the flood stage reached 50, or the flood level reached 51 feet 4 inches. That was 5 feet 10 inches higher than any flood had ever been before. 
Now let that sink in, not five feet ten above flood stage, but above any previous flood, probably the one of 1884, which up till 36 had been the benchmark. Between 800 and 1,000 people were left homeless. Uh, once again, volunteers, brave volunteers in rowboats went out uh, to rescue people. And if you're familiar with New Cumberland, you know it uh, sits on two levels. And the downtown business section, at least at the time, was on the lower level. And it was virtually wiped out. The Pennsylvania Railroad Station, which had been there since the first train arrived in town, was destroyed. There was a movie theater that uh, had all of its seats and screens and much of the equipment ruined. There was a shoe repair shop that was knocked completely off its foundation and taken across the street and it landed diagonally because all the repair equipment was on one side. And there was a funeral home that had its piano and its furnishings ruined, plus 42 caskets were washed out and began their voyage possibly as far as New Orleans, but certainly down the Ohio. Going into Brook County, in Wellsburg, the county seat, 80% of the town was underwater. 11 stores suffered flood damage, ranging from $1,500, and again, this was in Depression era dollars, so $1,500 was a good bet, on up. And the Erskine Glass Factory sustained $50,000 worth of damage. Uh, there were also two deaths in Wellsburg. Um, again, a crew of three brave rescuers. Uh, they rescued a woman and her two young children, but then the boat capsized. Uh, one of the rescuers, a decorated World War I veteran, drowned, and so did uh, one of the children who was only three years old. The others managed either to swim to safety or were picked up by other rescuers. On a somewhat lighter note in Wellsburg, was the family who for years had wanted to get rid of an old, ugly, unwanted couch. So at the height of the flood, they threw it out the window, expecting the floodwaters to take it away. Uh, when the waters receded, they found out that the fabric had absorbed the water and it landed right where they dropped it. <laughs> Continuing into Ohio County, um, there were few cities that were hit any harder than Wheeling. Uh, certainly none in this area other than Pittsburgh. On March 18th, the river was rising at the rate of one foot an hour. Officials at the Warwood Dam at first said to expect a flood crest of 44 feet. That went up to 46, then to 48, and then they finally said, we don't know how, how high it's going to get. When it crested on March 19th, it crested at 55 and a half feet at the Warwood Dam. Flood stage at the dam was 36 feet. So the river was six inches shy of being 20 feet above flood stage. To give you a little idea how high that took the waters, um, the city streetcars were taken to higher ground and they were parked along Oaf Street where they were just barely out of the flood. Radio station WWVA remained on the air 92 consecutive hours, broadcasting flood information and other news, uh, letting people know if they got word that their loved ones were safe. There were nine deaths in Wheeling, which was likely more than any other city for the entire flood other than Pittsburgh. In one case, a rescue boat capsized. Uh, in another case, the bottom fell out of a rescue boat. Uh, there was a natural gas explosion that killed two people. And several older people died of what was termed exposure, which was sort of a catch-all for, for any number of conditions associated with the flood. Uh, perhaps the saddest story was uh, the two-year-old who fell down the stairs of his family home into flood water and drowned. 6,400 families in Wheeling were driven from their homes. That represented about 27,000 people. On Wheeling Island, every house flooded. Uh, the one that set the highest had never had floodwaters before. This time, it had three inches. Uh, from there, the numbers, of course, went up dramatically. Now, the people on the island were used to floods. 
They were almost an annual event, and believe it or not, several told me that they actually looked forward to them. Uh, they would hear that they were coming, they would get the furniture moved upstairs, then they would get a keg of beer and take it upstairs, and look forward to a day or two of mandatory vacation. Well, they soon realized that this one was different, including the man who started early with his keg of beer, fell asleep on his bed, rolled over and was awakened because his hand was wet. Well, he didn't have any way of getting out and he spent the duration standing on that bed to get himself above the water. Uh, one man who, well, by the time I interviewed him was uh, well up in years, but just a boy at the time, uh, he told me that his, his family headed upstairs. Um, and he described, as did several other people, just the, the hideous sights and sounds through the night. Uh, electrical lines sparking, uh, people crying out to rescuers for help. And at one point, as they were standing at the window waiting for rescuers to come and get them, a utility pole transformer sparked and set the pole on fire, at which point his mother looked out and said, fire above us, water below us, as she picked up her prayer book. But they were rescued. Probably, the, for at least this area, the most enduring symbol of the 1936 flood was the Wheeling Gospel Tabernacle. Uh, this was a makeshift church. It was also known as the Glory Barn. It had been built by a radio preacher and apparently built in a sort of shoddy manner out of whatever materials happened to be available. But it was a huge structure. And when the flood approached its height, it lifted the gospel tabernacle right off what little foundation it had and started it downriver. Now, there were people who were in its path who actually thought that they could divert this thing with two before planks. They would have probably been killed if they had tried, but fortunately the glory barn split in two. Half of it went down a street where it uh, tore off a few porches, and the other half went out into the front channel, and I'm told ended up uh, at New Martinsville, although it had to have gotten through Lock 14 to do that, but that was probably entirely possible at the time. I was also told that after the flood was over, um, the minister who had erected the glory barn came back and started walking around the island to solicit funds to start rebuilding and got chased off, uh, including by one woman who was wielding a hatchet. Crossing the river, we come to Bel Air. As you well know, for the most part, Bel Air sits above the floodplain, but not entirely. Uh, all of Bel Air's schools were flooded, and did I come in on Erie Street? Is that the name of the street? Um, Belmont. Belmont, thank you. Yeah, Erie Street was where the tabernacle went, I think, on the island. Um, it was flooded for a distance of about a mile, north to south. Five post office workers were not hurt, but they were stranded for one night, and they made makeshift beds out of mailbags. And also in Bel Air, and I know there's nobody in Bel Air today that would be like this, but back at the time there was one. A guy who got drunk, decided that the flood would be a good opportunity to go for a ride in his skiff, which he did, and he crashed through a huge plate glass window of a barber shop. No problem, he just crashed the skiff through another window and made his way out. Bel Air also marked the end of definitely the most unusual rescue, and even though I have sources for this, I'm still a little bit dubious of this story. Um, there was a gentleman who had moved out west, but he had relatives uh, in this area and in Washington, Pennsylvania, and he chose March 1936 as the time to come back east and visit them. Well, he was told there was no way he was going to get across the river, so he decided to go and uh, seek shelter with relatives that he had in Yorkville. Well, he couldn't get to their house either, but he found another home, knocked on the door. Nobody was there, but the house was unlocked, so he just went in. He didn't have much choice. He noticed that the furniture had been moved upstairs, so he went upstairs with it, found a bed, lay down, and fell asleep. 
he was awakened by a sort of a shaking. And it prompted him, he looked out and saw the water rising and he went up onto the roof. The shaking got worse and pretty soon the house was knocked off its foundation and was floating down the river. He just about got killed when the uh, house almost hit the B&O bridge here at Bel Air, but he just missed it. And then he noticed an airplane coming up the river. And it was two men from Dayton uh, who were working for a news organization and had come to uh, take pictures. We didn't think much of it, but then the plane turned and approached him again at a much slower rate of speed and a much lower altitude. They lowered a rope and told him to grab hold. He felt it against his shoulder and reached out and, as he said, began swinging like crazy. The two men in the plane pulled him up in, landed at Bel Air and deposited him safely. At least that's the story. Continuing south, still in Belmont County, but at the very edge, Powhatan Point. Uh, Powhatan is a very flood-prone town, at least uh, the downtown area and most of it. There, people quite literally headed to the hills uh, to escape the waters. Reportedly, there were 150 who took shelter in just one house, and many others uh, were accommodating people. Two Coast Guard boats were finally uh, dispatched to try to, well, Powhatan was completely isolated, so to find out what in the world was going on, um, they found that things were not as bad as they expected. Nobody was killed. They had made it to safety. In fact, the main concern was the fact that there was no water, drinking water available except for spring water. Um, so they saw to it that the people got inoculated and not much harm beyond that. Crossing the Ohio into Marshall County, Benwood was one of several flood-prone communities on the river that had a plan, certain routines that they followed every time there was a flood, but again, this one was different. One woman told me, nobody moved a thing until Wheeling Steel moved. Well, as the waters approached, Wheeling Steel called out its employees to get equipment to higher ground uh, or higher up in the factory. They did, uh, but even at Wheeling Steel, they didn't realize how quickly these water were rising. And 25 employees went out to the parking lot when they were done with their work to find that their cars had been flooded. Another routine they had in Benwood was that everybody took their pianos to the central school. Well, again, there had never been a flood like this, and 45 pianos were ruined by the waters. Heading down to Moundsville on March 17th, the Moundsville Daily Echo ran a headline that said, Flood Threat Not Probable. The next day, the headline in the Echo said, Flood Waters 21 Inches Above 1884 Record. Well, even at that, even with the newspaper telling them they didn't have to worry, uh, Moundsville really didn't have to worry that much because, again, it sits pretty high above the riverbanks, but there were 100 homes and factories uh, that were flooded. Continuing down now into Wetzel County, the first community you come to is Proctor. The damage there was not too serious, but there were two examples of community cooperation in Proctor. Uh, the first was the group of men who built a fire right at the water's edge and kept it going for the duration of the flood. Then somebody found a big iron kettle and they made a community stew. Everybody brought out and contributed whatever they had to the stew pot, sort of like the story Stone Soup, uh, and they kept that going the whole time and that's what fed them. Uh, another example of community cooperation occurred later in the spring, long after the floodwaters had receded. A gentleman decided to go down and clean out the bottom land close to the river, and he came across a huge wooden barrel. And it had an appealing smell. So he brought it back up to his home, and some of the neighbors came by, and sure enough, when they uh, popped the lid off this barrel, it was filled with wine. Well, the women folk said, don't drink that, that's dangerous, you idiots. But men being men, they didn't listen. And one brave soul took a sample and declared, it's good, boys, 
So the menfolk spent the rest of their day gathered around the barrel, and by the evening they were on a pretty good mood. But despite that enthusiastic beginning, that barrel of wine lasted for nearly a year. In New Martinsville, 80% of the homes were flooded. The flood uh, reached 51.1 feet at Lock uh, 15. But New Martinsville was ready, partly because they had been through this before. New Martinsville was very flood prone. Also, I suspect they had been listening to KDKA and WWVA, and they realized that uh, this was going to be worse than anything before. They had a little bit more warning. So while there was extensive flooding, there was no loss of life, and uh, loss of property was also limited. Now, I mentioned the 37 flood that devastated Marietta and Point South. Somewhere between New Martinsville and Marietta, you would reach the point where the 36 and 37 floods were equal uh, in flood stage. I don't know where that would be, probably somewhere close to Sistersville. But if you look at the flood totals for Marietta in 1937 and Wheeling in 1936, they are almost exactly equal, and vice versa too. So 36 was the bad one upriver, 37 down. Still, in Marietta, on March 20th, um, the crest hit 41, or 48 feet, 48.1 um, feet, and this was enough to put five feet of water in Front Street. Though, as I say, the following year it was much worse than that. And even on down the river, while 37 was the bad one for them, 36 wasn't fun. Uh, in Pomeroy, there was 12 feet of water in several stores. Of course, Pomeroy is another town that sits right snug on the river. Uh, the crest reached Ironton on March 23rd. Uh, at 58 feet 8 inches, and this put 3 to 4 feet of water in the city streets there. By the time it got to Cincinnati, uh, the crest wasn't nearly as bad, although it was, the river was 8 feet above flood stage. It flooded about 2,000 homes, um, mostly ones that set, of course, very, very close to the river. A few days after that, there was a point that the entire Ohio River from Pittsburgh to Cairo was flooded. Uh, worse some places than others, but, but the entire river, its entire duration, did still experience flooding. So forgotten or not, the 1936 flood was a real thing. And for people who went through it, it was a real thing, and I can back this up, just ask my mother that uh, no matter how old they, they grow, they definitely always remember. And that's the end of the formal talk.